Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here at Lighthouse Discipleship Center. Uh, thank you for joining our broadcast this morning. Uh, we apologize in advance for, uh, for some of you who've been following us that week. We've been trying to uh, get our live stream a little bit more dialed in. Uh, if you're watching, you're not having any problems. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, just so you know, we are trying to get our live stream dialed in so you can watch it directly live here on Facebook, as well as our website at lighthousediscipleship.org. And in addition to that, being also to see a live stream on YouTube, our YouTube channel. We do have a YouTube channel, uh, Lighthouse Discipleship uh, Center. Anyway, uh, we're still working on some of those speed bumps. We got some uh, equipment this week, and we just haven't had a chance to get that dialed in. We have some uh, distractions, uh, good distractions, but distractions nonetheless. And uh, anyway, uh, I just want to let you also know, just uh, on that note, we have our uh, Bible study tonight at uh, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, we'll be almost wrapping up. We might even wrap it up tonight, our, our book, Don't Limit God. But just because I say we're wrapping up, we're getting to the good parts. <laughs> uh, we're getting to the really good part of the, of the book, Don't Limit God. When we're done with this one, we will start a new book called The True Nature of God, both written by Andrew Womack. And starting this Wednesday... Uh, this Wednesday, the 16th, at 7 p.m., uh, we will be live streaming our new Bible study on the new you and the Holy Spirit. The new you and the Holy Spirit. So that's going to be a new addition to our live stream and our, our Bible study. So we'll have two Bible studies a week, Sunday night at 6 and Wednesdays at 7. And uh, we're right here on Facebook Live. And then uh, and additionally, too, as I already stated, we're we'll looking at getting those live streams directly to our website as well as to our YouTube channel. We already have a YouTube channel. We've actually had it for some time, just as long as we've been live streaming. Uh, we just have not brought a lot of attention to that. Uh, we also have free Bible classes and other material free on our website at whitehousediscipleship.org as well as a place to give. And we thank those who have been partnering with us. Uh, and we thank you for your faithful contributions so we can do, continue to do what we do and, uh, and uh, we just bless that seed in the name of Jesus. Uh, thank you for that. All right, well, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and jump right back into our message this morning. We're, uh, in this, we're talking about resting in his goodness. Uh, back in 2004, the Lord gave Sherry and I a word uh, at the time that we needed it and it's just been a reoccurring word to us. When he told us, rest in my goodness, and I will take care of everything. Rest in my goodness, and I will take care of everything. I think we're in week five this week, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but uh, we're in our fifth part. We've, we spent the first two or three weeks talking about resting. And we established the fact that resting in God has a lot to do with faith. Trusting in Him. Relying on Him. Uh, has a lot to do with faith. And then we've been transgressing to the second part of the message, which we've been talking about his goodness. Where we're resting, not just resting, we're not being passive, we're not being lazy, we're not being complacent. We're resting in his goodness. And we've been talking about the goodness of God. And we didn't we have not even done close to an exhaustive study on the goodness of God. We would be here for all eternity talking about that. But as we continue to talk about that, we're gonna be trans trans uh, um, Progressing, let me just use a different word that I was trying to get. We'll be progressing to our third part, which we're talking about when he says, Rest in my goodness, and I will take care of everything. And his goodness includes everything. Really, when you think about it, if you do the first two, rest in his goodness, the second part is just a byproduct. At the same point in time, we're going to bring some attention to that. Though. And, and the Bible is full of it both no Old and New Testament, about resting in his goodness and God saying, take care of everything. And so I'm going to hope we tie this all together. <coughs> As we kind of wrap this serious towards conclusion, we won't finish today, uh, but at the same point in time, that's the direction we're going. Uh, okay? So hopefully you're all on board. I can't see you're nodding your heads or shaking your heads, but I just trust by faith that you're, you, you're following me so far. So if you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and turn with me to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. <coughs> and 
Peter writes, and it's a very familiar passage to some of you, For I know the thoughts that I, I think to, towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. I want to come back to that. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I want to talk over real quick to the King James. I just want to read, read, read verse 11 real quick. I just like how that reads in the King James. It says, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you unexpected end. I like that. Expected. As you can see, I'm emphasizing that. Expected end. God has an expected end. He has his plans, his thoughts for us are good. We're talking about resting in his goodness, and he will take care of everything. And he's already told us that his thoughts towards us are good. He has an expected end. There's a qualifier here that we must seek his good, seek him and find him. I'm going to comment on that in just a moment. You know, this verse is very meaningful to me back in uh, uh, when it's 1988. Now, that's going back a few decades. Uh, and I was in high school near my sophomore year. I know I'm not going to share the whole story, but I, you know, I grew up in a good Christian home. I went to church, I would read my Bible every day. Some of it, I'll be honest, sometimes I would read my Bible more out of duty than I was out of a relationship. But nonetheless, I was in the Word of God. And even if it's done wrong, I don't, I don't necessarily encourage that. I think we have, need to have a better attitude. We need to have a relationship, not just a religious duty attitude. But the Word of God won't return void. And the Word of God is still powerful. It might not have a full effect if we're not receiving it properly. But we have a better chance of receiving it if we're in it versus not being in it at all. If I'm making, I hope I'm making sense with that. But anyway, I was at uh, the revival that was starting to take off in my high school. And God was starting to get my attention. And uh, I was bothered in my own heart why I was on fire for God like my classmates were. It bothered me. And that's a good bother. It was a good bother. Then I went home that night to do my regular devotions. I actually had two reading plans I was following. This was the second one I was following. And I don't have time to share the whole story, but God was, this is one of the most intimate times I had with the Lord, uh, especially in, in my high school days. Uh, well, God, I just, for well, the first time in my life, I remember having a dialogue with God. And uh, I was like, why am I not seeking you with all my heart? Uh, why am I not? And, and he led me to Matthew 6, 33. Uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And I asked God the question, how do I seek you? What does that look like? And he led me to this passage here in Jeremiah 29. He says, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I've been learning through the years what it means to seek him with all the heart. Now, those of us who follow the grace message might find some of what I'm saying contradictory. It might sound to you like I'm talking about performance. And I think we have to make sure that we don't misunderstand faith for performance. We put faith in His grace. It's not grace and no faith, and it's not faith and no grace. We have to, it, it's not us, it's His grace. But we're putting faith in His grace. That makes sense? <clears throat> the power, <clears throat> I can have power and electricity in this room, but until I turn on the power switch by faith, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be activated. It's not gonna be received. You can you can get, you know, we're getting close to Christmas here. If you can, it's surprising how time flies. But if you give me a Christmas gift and I don't un I don't open it and use it. Your gift, as awesome as it is, has no value until it's received and used. That might be a silly illustration, but I'm trying. We put faith in His grace. You know, I have a, we have two vehicles in the garage, but until we have gasoline and a key to turn it on, it's not going to do anything. Yeah, if I had a bunch of keys but no car to put it into, then I can't go anywhere either. I can't. Drive a vehicle without the. I can't put a key in a vehicle without the vehicle. 
And I can't drive a vehicle without the key. Am I making sense? We need both. We need to put faith in His grace. When we're seeking God, it's not us. You know, Paul says in this way, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live, I live by the faith of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is using faith in that. We put faith in his grace. We seek him. We pursue him. I don't, you know, I, I'm married. I have a wife. I have a beautiful wife. But if I don't pursue the relationship, the relationship is, is not going to go anywhere. I can't just say, well, I'm married. I have my certificate. We're married. I have the ring. I may have bowed to you. What more do you want? She wants a relationship. Not just a ring. Not just a marriage certificate. She wants a marriage. God doesn't want a religion. He wants a relationship with us. God wants to take care of everything in our lives, but we must rest in his goodness. We must put faith in his goodness. We must pursue a relationship. And when you pursue, a when you have a relationship with anybody, it goes both ways. Whether we're talking about a marriage relationship, we're talking about a parent-child relationship, or we're talking about a friendship, or an employer-employee relationship. Both sides of the relationship have a part to put into the relationship. Including an employer-employee relationship. The, the employer must give to the employee just as much as the employee must give to the employer. It's not going to work. It will only work so far, if at all, if both parts are not pursuing, seeking the relationship. But we'll find him if we seek him. He's not lost. He's not hiding. He's not playing hide and seek. But we have to pursue him. It says in Proverbs that wisdom cries aloud in the streets. God's not hiding. Even when the fall, when Adam fell in sin, God, God never hid. God never hid from Adam. God has never hid from mankind. But Adam hid from God. We must rest in his goodness and he will take care of everything. And the Lord's plans for us are nothing but good. <clears throat> and the evil we experience in this world, in this life, doesn't come from God. It's part of this fallen world. It comes from the enemy who kills, steals, and destroys. Sickness kills, steals, and destroys. It didn't come from God. Lack kills, steals, and destroys. It doesn't come from God. It says in Zephaniah that God can't do evil. God can't do unrighteousness. God's not going to do what his son accomplished at the cross. What his son paid for. But as we follow God's plan for our lives, we can be assured of the outcome. We can be assured that if he has an expected end for us. He has a future and a hope. Which the King James translates that like expected in. I like that. Because some, just because we have a future, some people are uh, like, what is my future? Is it good or bad? No, we have an expected in. We have a good plan. God has a goodness for us. Let uh, Taco real quick. I'm not quite done here, but Taco real quick to me the Romans 15 29. Romans chapter 15. Verse 29, and I just make, I want to make a side comment here. I want to use this verse. This is Paul speaking towards the end of the book to the Romans. He says, but I know when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Again, I'm in Romans 15, 29. I want to read it again. Paul is saying, as he, as he concludes his letter to the Romans, to, uh, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. You know, I want everything I do, 
as a pastor, as a friend, as a brother, as a husband, to experience formal, the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. I want to come to you. I want to present to you. I want to be to you. I want, I want Christ in me to present to you the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. There's a, folks, we're talking about the goodness of God. The gospel is good news. And in this gospel, in this good news, there is a fullness. There is a blessing. But we need to receive it. We need to seek it. We need to, well, first of all, we need to know it. And then believe it. And receive it. And walk in it. The gospel is the grace. But in the gospel, there's goodness. In the gospel, there is, and it's not just a gospel, it's the gospel of Christ. And in this gospel of Christ, there is a fullness. There is a blessing. There is an expected end. But we, and, 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 but we need to trust it. We need to rest in it. We need to uh, uh, walk in it. Just because we are walking in it, doesn't mean we're the source. We're walking in it. It's the source. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to him who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for in it, the gospel, is, a, is righteousness revealed from faith to faith, for the just or the righteous shall live by faith. I just quoted Romans 1, 16 and 17. The gospel reveals this right relationship with God. The gospel is the power of God. But this power of God, this gospel, is revealed from faith to faith. For the just or righteous shall live by his faith. The, God, the righteous, the just shall live by resting in this gospel that is the power of God to everyone. There is a power, the same power to raise Christ from the dead, the same goodness and nature of God to its fullness. It's in this good news, this gospel, this Christ we have received, that we have been born of, not just born into, we have been born of. <coughs> Jane, uh, Peter says, we have been born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the enduring word of God. There's a blessing. But those who seek the Lord with all their hearts are promised victory and an expected end. This, keep in mind, folks, this passage in Jeremiah that we have been reading this morning, this promise was spoken to people who were in exile. Jeremiah is writing this, but he's writing it to people who were in exile. In other words, they, they were under God's punishment. Yet, he still had a good plan and an expected end for them. For them to prosper. God had a, a future and a hope for them to prosper. And of these people that Jeremiah is writing to is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we see that despite them being in exile because of punishment as a nation, that they had an expected end. And they saw the goodness of God even in exile. Am I making sense? Sometimes, I mean, that's just, that, that speaks volumes to me. That, that he's this promise is being made to those who were being punished. For not, and you don't get punished for doing good. <laughs> but, and, and I don't even like that word punished. They, they were being disciplined. They were being reproved. Because it, it, discipline is for your future. Punishment is about your past. Okay? Punishment doesn't do any good if, it, if there's no discipline involved. There's no, there's no expected end to it. You know, but, but discipline is to train you, to teach you. We were watching, uh, I, 
uh, war movie last night, and you know, the, uh, I think it was called Glory, but the, the, so, uh, not the, the commander, whatever, he had to be hard on his people. And it didn't look like love, but if they're not prepared, they're not gonna, ha they're not gonna handle the battle. He's saving their lives. He, he's protecting them. He's loving them. He's doing his job. He, in a sense, he, he's not their buddy. He's their commander. But he has a job that he has been sworn to do to prepare his men for battle. And as pastors, and as friends, as clergy, and whatnot, however you want to, as brothers and sisters, Christ, we are here to spur one another towards good deeds. God has an expected hand. Seek it. Pursue it. If, there, if I gave you a map, and I said, if you follow this map, you're going to find some hidden treasure. Are you just going to sit on your couch and, and just wait for it to come? No, you have to seek it. You have to pursue it. You're not the treasure. I'm not the treasure. I'm just giving you a road map. Go get it. It's yours. I'm showing you that. I'm telling you it's yours. I'm telling you where it's at. But I'm telling you to go receive it. You go seek it. The gospel, the, 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 Jesus gives a parable about treasure. Multiple parables, actually. There is a treasure. There is a, and it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so we need to pursue him. Let me just say this. God will take care of you better than you can take care of yourself. God will take care of you better than you could ever take care of yourself. Let me say it this way. God knows what will satisfy you. God knows what will satisfy you. Even more than you do. You might think this and that will satisfy you, and you may be right. And you, but He knows. He created you. He's recreated you in Christ. He's, given, he's the one that gave you those desires and those appetites. And God not only will take care of you better than you will take care of yourself, but He knows what will truly satisfy the longings in your heart. Above or beyond your prayers. And fears. Yet many people have said the Lord hasn't answered their prayers. God hasn't answered my prayers. This verse, this passage in Jeremiah, makes it very clear that those who seek the Lord with all their hearts make the connection. Philemon says that the communication of your faith becomes effectual as you acknowledge every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. It doesn't work that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord gets what they want. And I've seen this as pastors. I've seen this as a brother in Christ. Sometimes people just want enough to help them get out of the mess. So they can go right back into living a life of rebellion or isolation from God. That's not how it works. That's not the way it works, folks. But those who seek the Lord with all their hearts will find. When we rest in his goodness, he will take care of everything. Turn with me now to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to use a few different verses here, but I'm going to start with Matthew 7. I don't know how far we'll get with some of this today, but we'll just keep going until we run out of time. Matthew chapter 7, we're picking up verse 7, so Matthew 7, 7. And we're actually picking up in the middle of the context here. This is another favorite childhood verse I had, but one that I also had questions about. In Matthew 7, 7, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and and it will be open to you. For everyone, say everyone, everyone, who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it 
will be open. Or what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish will he give him a serpent? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, Whatever you want men to do to you, you also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. There's a lot here. I'm not going to. I'm not going to be spending time on everything that's in this passage of scripture. But let me start with the end verse in the, in the regards. Some of us might not appreciate God calling us evil, <laughs> but how do you, being evil, know how to give good gifts? We're talking about the goodness of God to your children. How much more will your Father give, who is in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask? You know, ever since I was a child, this has been an amazing promise. In some regards, it's so simple. And yet, there's been sometimes I haven't understood it. Because I have measured this verse by my experience. Version measuring it by the word of God and just simply resting in what he said. My experience sometimes doesn't match what I read. And so therefore I magnify my experience and, and sometimes get, somehow reconcile that this isn't true or there's a different interpretation. We're dangerous when we do that. Yet we do that all the time. If my experience does not match up what the Word of God says, the Bible says, let man, let God be true, and every man a liar. Not a, he, he, Pastor Dave, you called me evil, now you call me a liar. This is not going so well. But God is true. He is a good, good Father. Jesus has already provided our needs through his atonement on the cross. Everything we need is in Jesus. Everything we need is in provided in that atonement and all the benefits that come with that salvation. To, to, to remember, we talked about we've been talking about rest. We've talked about Sabbath rest. God provided everything for man before he created man in the garden. That was the Old Testament, the New Testament, and that was a shadow of the New. God has provided everything we need in Christ and then recreated us in Christ Jesus. Jesus was the firstborn of many brethren. God reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And in that reconciliation, there are benefits. The provisions are waiting for us to receive them. So many times we think we're waiting on God when God is actually waiting on us to receive what he has already provided through Jesus Christ. We just have to ask, seek, and knock. This is profound if we understand this. It's very simple and very profound. But so many people... They're, they're, they're off by a little. But it's just like flying an airplane. If you're off one degree, you could be on a totally different continent. That's a time. We don't ask in the sense that we don't believe they are already ours. Some of us are asking and we're not convinced that what we're asking for we already have permission. We already have, they're already ours. We're hoping they are. We're wishing they are. We're crossing our fingers. We're, we'll do anything. We'll fast. We'll, we'll do anything. We're hoping, we're hoping, we're hoping. We're almost like playing lottery with God that our, for our healing, for our prayer request to be answered. When God's already said yes and amen. 
All the promises of God are yes. And in him, amen, to the glory of God, by us, we have a part to play. It's by us, it's through us. We ask how Jesus instructed us to ask. We're going to come back to Matthew 7, but again, remember I said we picked it, we're picking this up in middle context. He's already been talking about asking. Go back to Matthew, or Matthew 7, go back to Matthew 6 real quick for a moment. Go, back, go to Matthew 6 and 11. Let's pick up the context here. Matthew chapter 6, just one chapter ahead. In Matthew 6, verse 11, Jesus had already said this. Before he told before he said, Ask, seek, and knock, Jesus already said it. He's talking about prayer. He says, He's talking about prayer. I'm going to pick it up actually in verse 9. In this manner, therefore, I pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 11 is where I want to get to. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. Verse 11 is really where I want to zero in on in connection with what we're talking We're talking about asking. Bigger scope, we're talking about resting in his goodness, he'll take care of everything. But specifically, right now, we're talking about asking. And in the Lord's Prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when you read, have you ever read that, the Lord's Prayer? So I said it all the time. Give us. That sounds demanding. Give it to me. <laughs> Yet it's not being done in an arrogant, selfish way. This is a child who, he starts off by saying, our Father in heaven. So if he's our father, we're his child. And the child of his Lord, give me some bread. There's a respect there. He's the father. But any good parent is going to say, anything I have is yours. In the sense that the refrigerator's there. You want some bread? I'll give you bread. I'm not going to. He already establishes the fact in Matthew chapter 7. What good parent? If a child asks for bread, well, he's going to give him a, a, a stone. If he asks for a fish, he's going to give him a, a serpent or a scorpion. No good parent's going to switch it out on them like that. Wanting to give him something deadly like a scorpion or a serpent. But he is a good, good father. And if we as evil parents, quoting him, will give good gifts to our children. How much more will our Heavenly Father not give us good gifts to those who ask? Give us our day, our daily bread. <coughs> we can ask God daily for bread, for the things that we need. Again, this is not a request, but a demand. I'm loving the man. But a demand nonetheless. This is like children coming to their parents for something to eat. Children should not have to beg for their food. That would be a reflection of the parent, not the child. If a child has to beg for food, I'm not talking about overindulging. I'm not talking about necessarily uh, having all sweets and junk food. But just in a general sense, children should not have to beg their parents for food. That makes sense? Unless the parents are struggling, that's another thing. And that's another subject. But in a general sense, children should not have to beg their parents for food. That would reflect the parents, not the child. Yet many people see God as not inclined to meet their needs, so they beg Him. We, that's giving an image that God is just like a parent who would not willingly give food to their children. If parents, natural parents, if, if children don't have to beg their natural parents for food, then how much more or how much less should we have to beg our Father 
with the things that we need to distribute in our basic needs. This is not resting in his goodness. Rat begging God. Having an attitude, having a, a, a mentality, a belief system, a prayer life that is begging God is not resting in his goodness. Am I making sense? Hebrews 4.16, you don't have to turn there, it says we can come boldly to his throne of grace to receive mercy in our time of need. We can come boldly. But yet much of the church does not really believe the promises of God. They say they do. Because there's a lot of people, folks, who are acting in unbelief, hoping crossing their fingers that God will do something. They're praying to the right God. They're praying to God. And that's all good. But if you really peel back the onion and you're honest, there's unbelief there. And much of our prayers, we're just hoping Lord, if it will be your good, if it be your will, heal me. He's already died for your sins and your sicknesses. It's going to be your will. He never once rejected anyone who had faith to be healed. Jesus never did. The only places he did not heal were where there was an unbelief. He's our daily prayer. Again, much of the church does not really believe the promise of God. They are asking in unbelief, hoping, wishing that he, God will do something. But the superior approach, church, is to believe God has already provided all that we need in creation and through the cross of Jesus Christ. The creation is a shadow of what Christ has provided. We've already established that in the first two weeks. The superior approach to God is to believe that God has already provided all that we need so we can come boldly with confidence that He will not only hear us, but He says, Everyone who comes, asks, receives. Everyone who seeks will find. Everyone who knocks the door will be open. We need to believe that. We need to rest as that is true. Not just hoping. See, really, biblical hope, if you want to use the word hope, if you define, want to define it in the Greek, it means a positive expectation of good. Hope, by definition, I'm not talking about natural hope. I'm talking about biblical hope. It's a positive expectation of good. There's an expectation. And that, that's probably what I'm, what, when, I'm when I'm defining unbelief and faith. Unbelief is hoping, but there's no expectation that anything's going to happen. They're hoping. That's a worldly, that's a natural form of hope. But biblical is, it has a, is a positive expectation of good. And faith is a substance of things hoped for. It's a substance. Faith will see the unseen. We'll get, we'll get to some of that in a minute. You know, again, piggybacking on Matthew 16, the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily prayer. Keep your finger, we're not done here in Matthew, but... Go with me real quick to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus 16 verse 4. And then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, 
and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. There's a law here, and I don't have time to, to, to piggyback on all this. But the daily bread, it, it, it points back to, to, to this manna that came from heaven, that they had to get it daily. They, every, they didn't, all they, God provided it by grace. God supernaturally provided them daily bread by grace, but they had to go out and receive it. And part of that command was on the seventh day, there was no manna, because on the, the day prior, God gave them a double portion to see them through the Sabbath. But when they did not hearken His voice, when they did not obey His voice, and they left it overnight, it turned into worms, and when they... When they went out on the Sabbath to try and they were surprised it wasn't there. They didn't listen. But if we're seeking God, part of seeking God is we're going to listen. If, if I give you a road map on, on where the treasure is, follow the map. Don't get mad at me because you went a different direction. I'll even give you a GPS. And you, you, you make a right turn instead of a left. GPS will tell you to make a U-turn. But don't get mad at me if you won't follow the directions. Seek him. Believe, he, says, he says in his word, believe my gospel. Believe my good news. You're a child of God. Believe me. Trust me. Rest in me. Rest with me. Believe my word. I've given you my word. I've spoken to you. I've given you my spirit to bring things to remembrance. Believe me. Rest in me. Trust me. I'll give it to you daily. And you can ask any time. You can come boldly to my throne of grace. You know, in some kingdoms, unless you were invited to see the king, they could, you could it'd be capital punishment. But God says we can come boldly to the throne of grace to receive mercy in our time of need. And some of the, the, the best prayers is, Lord, I can't do this, help. And he will be your helper. Ask, receive. But if he tells you to do something, go do it. It's not about your performance. It's about you trusting what he said. You're not trusting what you're doing. You're trusting what he told you to do. You're trusting him. It's not your doing that's the magical formula. It's his word that's the magic. When you put faith in his grace. When you put faith in his word. You're not the source. You can do. Let me just say this. You can do the exact same thing God told you to do. But you are trusting you, and it won't work. It's not about what you're doing. It's who you're trusting. It's who you're resting in. God says he, he resists the proud and gives grace to them. That's quoted in James and also verse John, I believe. Those who say, Lord, I can do this. That's pride. But grace, um, humility says, Lord, I need you. When David came on the scene of Goliath, he was trusting in his covenant relationship with God. And he looked to his brother, own brother, and he was cocky. But he was trusting God. He was resting in the covenant relationship he had with God. And he was victorious. The whole army of Israel, including King Saul, their leader, was walking in fear Pride looks, pride says, I can't do this. But it's looking inward. They just said, the best thing you can say, Lord, help, I can't do this. Yes. But some people say, I can't do this and just quit. They're still looking at themselves. But they're saying, God, I can't do this, but help. They're looking to God. There's a difference. One is resting in his goodness. One is just giving up. God desires us to live by faith. The just will live by faith. Faith in His grace. It's not faith in what we're doing. It's not faith in our performance. It's faith in His grace. It's faith in His word. When without hearing the word of God, you're not going to have faith to begin with. And faith works by love. 
If you don't know how much your father loves you, your faith won't work. The communication of your faith is effectual as you acknowledge every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. It's not just in you, it's in Christ Jesus. And where's Christ Jesus? In you. So in a sense, you're not trusting you, you're trusting Christ who is in you. And in you, and in Christ who's in you, is every good thing. That's what you're trusting in. And when you trust that, when you rest in that goodness, your faith will become effectual. God will take care of everything. God desires us to live by faith, to rest in Him. Galatians 3.11, real quick. We're heading back to Matthew, but on the way back, we're going to get a couple verses on the way back. Galatians 3.11 says this. I feel like i got to read some context. Verse 10. For as, many, uh, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written in the book of the law to, to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. If the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. There's so much here. I think the main thing I want to highlight on, and there's several verses that I could have read, that the just live by faith. God desires us to live by faith. He says, without faith, he says in Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says it this way. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Church, we live by faith. We live by faith, not by sight. We live by whatever God tells us. And God says to ask, we can ask. God says to seek, we can seek. And God says to, to knock, we can knock. And not only, does, not, not only does, does, does he tell us to do that, but he says, everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be open. In other words, I'm trying to paint a picture, folks. This faith is a lifestyle. Resting in his goodness is a lifestyle. Asking, seeking, knocking is a lifestyle. Give us today our daily bread is a life. It's a daily thing. It's a lifestyle. It's not a as needed occurrence. Some of us only pray, only ask, only seek when it's needed. It's needed on your best day as it is, just as much as it is on your worst day. But when we read, going back to Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 9 and the following, we need to believe that when we ask, seek, and knock, that's already ours. We just need to appropriate it by faith. We, in other words, we need to rest in His grace that He has already provided. We need to rest in His goodness. We need to ask for what he has already provided. We need to seek what we don't know. And we need to knock to open that which has been closed. There's some doors that have been closed. And God didn't close them. You think you did because you thought he said no. But you need to knock. How many of you know the enemy can try to close the doors too? How many of you know the enemy can restrain you? And circumstances and different things. Some believe and teach this means we keep asking, seeking, and knocking on a repetitive thing. And yes, it's a lifestyle, but what I'm going to say may sound a little contradictory to that. Every Greek dictionary that I've read, this is not communicated. In other words, every Greek dictionary I've read out there, and I even got this from Andrew. He says the same thing. Every Andrew Womack, those who know who he is. None of the Greek dictionaries tell us that we need to keep asking 
knocking and, and seeking him. Let me explain. In other words, we don't have to plead with God. That's what we're talking about. Some people think they have to keep asking to the blue in the face. Pleading with God. Please, Lord, please give me. Ask. And you're at, they're asking. They're knocking. Please let me in. Please open the door. Pleading. There's a different attitude. There's a different connotation. That's what we're talking about. Yes, it's supposed to be a lifestyle where we can ask Him daily. But regarding the same issue, we don't have to beg God. We do not have to plead. As is often communicated. Because none of the dictionaries even, 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 even communicate that. It, it's obvious that many people have prayed for things that have, they have not, that have not come to pass. That's been obvious. So as an attempt to reconcile these promises with their experiences, many have said, God said no. Or, this doesn't apply to everyone. This asking, this seeking, this knocking doesn't apply to everyone. But it clearly says in verse 8, for everyone who asks, receives. Don't say it's not for everyone when the Bible says it's for everyone. We need to know, in other words, we need to know how to receive. Let me just say this. God is a spirit. And he answers our prayers in the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is not seen with a natural eye. But faith gives tangibility to things that are not seen. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and I'm just toggling real quick, I want to come back to Matthew. He says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of of things not seen. Faith gives tangibility to the things that we cannot see in the natural realm. And prayer that meets the requirements outlined in God's word are always answered. Many times we don't perceive the answer because it comes in the spiritual realm first before it is manifested in the natural realm. Some people miss that. And some people think I'm just being a bunch of hocus pocus here. The spiritual realm is more real than the natural. God always answers, and he always answers in the spiritual realm first, before the natural realm. But if we waver, and I'm going to take you back on that, from our confident faith, our confident hope, we can abort the manifestation, but God did answer. <coughs> Go with me real quick to James chapter 1. Verse 6. It says, but let him act in faith. With no doubting. I'm in James 1, 6 and 7. But let him act in faith. With no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea. Driven and tossed by the wind. For let that man suppose. That he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double minded man. Unstable in all his ways. We can't act in doubt. We can't. Waver and abort the promise, abort the answer. We must ask and believe. Asking and believing is asking and receiving. Hebrews 10.35 says it this way. Hebrews 10.35 Therefore do not cast away your confidence which has great reward. We don't want to cast away our confidence. We don't want to cast away the evidence. Which is our great reward. We need to be confident. 
about the Word of God, about the promises of God. But everyone who asks receives. Everyone who asks receives. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 8, everyone, Jesus said to himself, everyone who asks receives. The Lord uses the way, uses it this way. And let me rephrase this. God, we're gonna we see here in Matthew 7, but we're gonna look at some other scriptures if we get that far today. The Lord uses the way parents feel about their children to relate how God feels about us. There's several times here. We see this in Matthew. There's a couple of accounts in Luke. We'll, we'll eventually get to if we don't get to today. But God uses the way parents feel towards their kids. The way how God feels towards us. He says, how many of you are evil would not, i got to paraphrase it, would not give good gifts to the, your children who ask? How much more will your father give good gifts to them? Even in the Lord's Prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread. He prefaced that by saying, our Father who is in heaven. He is our Father. He's a good, good Father. And I've talked to a lot of parents in the years. I used to work at a school for, uh, for a, a, a number of years. I think it was almost 10 years I worked there. And those parents were those kids. You don't mess with the kids. I've watched a lot of TV shows through the years. And when a, a child is kidnapped or something's happened, those parents love those kids. I know that's a different, different Hollywood and different things. But the, but the, but the, unless there's, there, there, there's some evil parent who just doesn't care about their kids because they don't care about anyone but themselves, they love the kids. Even a lot of the evil ones out there love the kids. And God, God but even here in Scripture, God used because He uses that because we can connect with that. That make sense? It's a known thing. Parents love their kids, and He uses how parents feel about their kids is the same way, even more how God feels about you, us. All but the vilest parents would answer their kids' requests with a yes. Yet we think that God answers our, our requests many times with a no. Something wrong. That's called unbelief. And the Bible calls, in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, calls that unbelief rebellion. If I want to take this further down that road. But that's not the direction I'm going with. I'm going, how if every good parent except for the vilest of parents would say yes to their parent and their kids' request, they're asking, they're seeking, they're knocking. How much more does our Father love us? And if you are pleading, if you're begging God with that attitude, you are not convinced He loves you. You might know about His love. And to a certain degree, you believe in his love, but you do not have a full revelation and convincing where you are resting in his love. Resting in his amazing love. And because you don't know his love, you can't rest in his goodness. Because you are not convinced his goodness towards you even exists. Or you think that his goodness towards you has limitations that you haven't met somehow. Let me just say this. His goodness towards you is not based on you. As far as, it's not based on whether you deserve it or not. It's based on his grace. You can't earn it. And you can't earn it away. He loved you. He loved you when you wanted nothing to do with I'm sorry. He loved you when you wanted nothing to do with him. He died for you 2,000 years ago before you were even born. Naturally speaking. He loved you. 
He's always loved you. Let's go real quick and I'm running out of time, but let's go to Luke 11. Luke 11. I said that how God uses parents and their love for the kids. We talked about Matthew. We're now transgressing, moving forward, progressing to Luke 11, the second area. I want to give this illustration. But Luke, it says, Luke, beginning with Luke 5, says, And he said to him, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey. I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend. Yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Almost every commentator says that this parable is to teach importunity and earnestness in prayer. Yet, and I, Andrew agrees with me in this, I don't see this. That's the purpose and all. And that would go against the points he was already making about the Lord's Prayer in this, in this passage and other passages. I don't believe in this passage that, and I used to, I, even growing up, I, I, uh, I taught on this. But this, is, this passage, this parable, is not teaching about the purpose of persistence in prayer. And some of you are like, whoa, they, you're missing it now. See, the previous verses and the context and, the, and him talking about the Lord's Prayer and the even the following verses in this context are about God being a good, good Father. Who, and because he's such a good, good Father, we don't have to beg God to do what is right. In context here, Jesus is asking a question. Who has a friend that will refuse him help because it is midnight and inconvenient? That's the, I'm paraphrasing the question, but the question Jesus is asking is, who of you has a friend who will refuse you at midnight because it's midnight and it's inconvenient? You might know someone who would treat you that way. But those who would treat you that way are not friends. Friends help each other. Not only do parents care about their kids, but fr true friends care about their friends. If we had a friend calling us up at midnight, I might not be able to give him three loaves because I don't have three loaves, but I'll go down to Bonds or somewhere and get some if I have to. I'm not going to turn some away. And most of you would not do that. You might be a little cranky at midnight. I get that. But most of us have a good enough heart where if someone was in dire need, we would, we would get up. We would be inconvenient. Jesus taught in, a, in, a previous, in another parable about the Good Samaritan, a friend is one who helps others. But the point Jesus was making is that uh, if a friend will help you at the most inconvenient time, how much more will our Father who loves us help us without us persisting? We might have to persist even a friend at midnight. But we will never have to persist with God. Jesus is not teaching we have to persevere until God breaks down and gives in. That is not what God's teaching here. I mean, Jesus is teaching. He's not teaching. We have to keep begging God and plead with God until he, and persevere with God until he breaks down. He's not a wild stallion. We have to break him. God is more than willing to answer your prayers. 
We're talking about resting in his goodness and God will take care of everything. But with you pleading and begging and persevering in the attitude, it's not rest. It's not trusting God. You're treating him like a genie in the bottle. Yeah, you would, if, if we did have genies in the bottles, you would trust those three wishes more than you trust the word of God. That's wrong. It's good to have good friends. It's good to have good parents. But we can trust God more. This, God is more than willing to answer your prayers. And this is consistent with verse 8. He says, I say to you, he will not rise and give to him because he is his, his friend. Yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Jesus was ministering assurance our Father is ready and willing to answer our prayers. Jesus was saying, if we put so much faith in human friendships and human parents, how much more should we be able to rest in the goodness of God, our Father? We can trust our Father to grant our requests. We should come expecting to receive our answers to prayer much more than human friends in our time of need. This makes this parable compatible to the context versus contradictory. See, the comparison is a contrast, not a representation. Your friendships and your parents are not necessarily a full, a, 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 a clear representation of God. Am I making sense by saying that? Your father is better than your parents. And you, your father is better than your friends. And you might have amazing parents. I do. We do. You might have amazing friends. But God is better. Your heavenly father is better. Even your amazing parents, even your amazing friends could fail you. But God will never fail you. He is faithful, faithful, faithful. Yeah. I don't think I have time to finish the next one. The next one I've got to be going to is Luke 18. Talking about the persistent widow. It's on the same track as what we've been talking about. But I'm going to wrap this up without going further. I don't know if I'm making sense. I might be stepping on some of your toes. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm not trying to uh, do anything negative wrong. I'm trying to help. And I'm speaking to myself as much as I'm speaking to you. Folks, we need to rest in his goodness. Because he will take care of everything. We need to rest in God. He's a good, good father. And we can ask and receive. We can seek and we will find. He has an expected end. If we need a miracle, we can come boldly to his throne of grace and receive mercy in our time of need. You know, there's another thing that was here that I just I got a revelation early this week on is that sometimes we need to knock because some doors need to be reopened or opened. God has a way to open those doors that no man. I don't care how bolted and shut it is. Ask, seek, knock. If God's told you to go forward, but there's a there's Pharaoh's army on your backside and there's the Red Sea in your front and the mountains surrounding you on the right and left, and you're like, you're knocking. God can open the Red Sea for you. He can open 
He can open a door where no man even can see before or after, that there could even be a possible way. Pharaoh thought they were just sitting ducks, waiting by the river. He thought he had them cornered, boxed in. And yet, God told Moses, go forward. Maybe you are at your wit's end. Maybe you, 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 enough is enough, and you, you just don't know how to go forward. You don't even know if you can go another day. Ask. Come boldly to his throne of grace. Expect God. Receive. He'll give you an answer. If he's got to do a miracle like the Red Sea, he'll do it. If he's got to create something, he'll do it. If he's got to, uh, whatever he's got to do. You know, he can use what's in your hand. He can use the widow's oil to pay off your debts. When the doctor said there's no hope, he is hope. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm always going to point to trusting God. I'm always going to point to trusting Jesus in these teachings. Prayer works. But not begging God. Not pleading with God with no expectation. That's not prayer. Because at its core, prayer is nothing but a, a relationship with at its core. I believe prayer works. I believe, uh, you know, the faithful prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And when James quotes that, he's actually quoting from Kings where, where Elijah prayed seven times for the rain and then rain. He, seven, I believe in persistent prayer in the sense that we keep praying and we don't give up. But I don't believe in persistent prayer in the sense that we're begging God and hoping and being that we thinking that we can uh, persuade God otherwise. We don't need to persuade God. He's trying to persuade us. He's already provided. He's already said yes. He's already provided the answer. He's trying to persuade us to rest in his goodness and receive. Hopefully I'm making sense. And we're going to probably wrap this up next week, uh, this series. And then we'll get on to talking about the nature of God. I'll talk about uh, God revealed and talk about the names of God, which in many ways will be a continuation of what we've been talking about, but just for a, a, different, a different focus, a different, uh, <clears throat> just a different table being set before us. That make sense? Lord, we worship you. We magnify you. We give you thanks. We give you glory. We give you honor. Lord, teach us a people that we walk by faith and not by sight. Teach us a people that we, we walk and we live by faith. And, the, and him who loved us and gave himself for us. Teach us afresh what it means to ask. What it means to seek. And what it means to knock. Because you said everyone who asks receives. Lord, increase our faith in the sense that we're not getting new faith. We already have the measure of faith. But teach us how to activate it. Like a muscle, teach us how to, to exercise our faith. So we can see our faith working on a more regular consistency. Lord, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We worship you. We magnify you. Bless us as we go. In your name we give you thanks. Amen, amen. God bless you. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. And have a great day. Have a great week. And we'll see you this week on Wednesday at 7. Yeah, those of you who are interested. All right. Bless you. Bye-bye.